occurred to me there talking about Liam Lynch that although I know all about this stuff from reading about it growing up or reading books from my own interest, one, not even every Irish person is all that interested and some people regard it as pretty much ancient history. Um, having said that, at least most of them will know who Liam Lynch is, as w who are, you know have some moderate interest in history. But I feel I'm going to have to explain some of the background before we go on, and I'll try. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. I feel like this this is like I, I would have to take an elephant and start doing kebabs and eating the elephant. It's that big a task. Um, in any case, let's start with the Irish volunteers. If people want to ask me questions or, or if there's anyone who knows more about the subject, and of course there is, I'm not a professional historian. I'm just someone who has a amateur's interest in this from personal interest. Feel free to chuck stuff in. Any professional historian who's watching, if I make mistakes, please feel free to correct me. I'm not above it. I don't mind being corrected. I'm not going to throw hissy fits or bounce up and down. <laughs> Correction's part of the game. <laughs> right, here we have the Irish Volunteers, also known as the Irish Volunteer Force or the Irish Volunteer Army. Again, I'm using Wikipedia simply for the simple reason I'm trying to do basic presentations. If I tried to do a really in-depth presentation on this, that would be another matter. The Irish Volunteers were a paramilitary organisation established in 1913 by nationalists and republicans in Ireland. It was ostensibly formed in response to the formation of its Irish Judas Loyal counterpart, the Ulster Volunteers. And there straight away, I'll have to do the Ulster Volunteers tomorrow, I see. And before long, we'll be back at the time of Adam and Eve. And it's declared the primary arm was to secure and maintain the rights and com liberties common to the whole people of Ireland. Its ranks included members of Conrad and Gailey, Ancient Order of Hibernians. As I said in the last video, the Ancient of Hibernians at this time were a force to be reckoned with, but they're now not really a, that hugely important outside of Irish America. Sinn Féin and the Irish Republican Brotherhood increasing rapidly to a strength of nearly 200,000 by mid-1914. It's split in September of that year over John Redmond's support for the British war effort during World War I. And I'm going to have to do something about John Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party, I see as well there. Uh, and Uncle Tom, Tom Cobley as well, I see at this rate. Um, background, the Irish home move, um, movement dominated political debate in the British Isles since Prime Minister William Ewitt Glanstone introduced the first Home Rule Bill in 1886. As it tells you, there were a number of home rules but afterwards. Basically, they were rejected by the House of Commons. They were, there was lots of mucking about get, trying to get them through. It was a third home rule bill that here it notices, though, that caused a, a crisis um, between Irish Catholics, most of whom are nationalists, and unionists in Ulster. Um, on the 28th of September 1912 at Belfast City Hall, just over 450,000 units signed the Ultrax Covenant to resist the grinding of home rule. This was followed in January 1913 with the formation of the Ulster Vol Volunteers composed of adult male unionists. National politician Owen McNeil claimed that the establishment of the Ulster Volunteers were instigated, approved and financed by members of the Conservative Party. Furthermore, uh, Nick Neal claimed that the Liberal Party was not too terribly distressed by that proceeding. To be honest, he was probably had a point. I can't imagine the Conservative Party was over, overly upset by it. OK, here we go. The founders of the <laughs> Irish Volunteers. The initiative for a series of meetings leading up to the public inauguration of the Irish Volunteers came from the Irish Republican Brotherhood. As I said, I'll have to do something about them as well. This will get quite quite involved eventually. Balma Hobson, who is a Quaker, by the way, uh, <laughs> hardly enough, and he was founder of the co-founder of the Republic and Boy Scouts, Fiona Aaron, and member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. For the sake of this talk, the Irish Republican Brotherhood can be viewed as the forerunners of the IRA. That's a very simplistic description of them, and some some people watching may argue with it. 
just take it as a simplistic definition to be going on with, and I'll come back and enlarge on it. He believed the IRE should use the formation of the Ulster Volunteers as an excuse to try and persuade the public to form an Irish volunteer force. The IRB began the preparations for the open organisation of the Irish Volunteers in January 1913. James Stritch, an Irish IRB member, had the National Irish National Foresters build a hall at the back of 41 Parnell Square in Dublin, which was the headquarters of the Wolf Tone Clubs. <laughs> The whole of Irish history is colliding here. Anticipating the formation of the volunteers, they began to learn foot and drill and military movements. The IRB... Oh, before I go on, Michael Collins, along with several other IRB members, claimed that the formation of the Irish volunteers was not merely a knee-jerk reaction to the Ulster volunteers, but was in fact the old Irish Republican Brotherhood in full of force and was planned somewhere in Bath. It's really hard to know that. The IRB was an organisation that was very secretive and had lots of fingers in lots of pies and lots of secret sort of plans, some of which worked, some of which didn't, and it's very hard to know at this date over 100 years later, getting on for 110 years, how true or not true Michael Collins' claim is on that. I suspect it's there's some level of truth to it. The IRB knew they would need a highly regarded figure as a public front that would conceal the reality of their control. The IRB found in Owen McNeil, Professor of Early and Medieval History at University College, the ideal candidate. Okay, then you have the O'Reilly, who is a figure, a heroic and doomed figure in who will later die in the Easter Rising, who is a manager of the Gaily Glue newspaper. And I'll try and summarise from this point so this doesn't get too long. Basically, the Irish volunteers eventually split into two halves. The half that was Redmanite was happy to sort of support to some extent a role within the British Empire on the grounds that after World War I, they would get home rule. The more radical wing which eventually allied with people like Pierce and people like the, uh, named up there, Sean McDermott and Eamon Kent, uh, which consisted of around 10,000 or so, were more in favour of an open re rebellion. Eventually, after the Easter Rising, the Irish volunteers transitioned into what you might call the modern IRA, although, as I say, the IRB is also involved in that. It's very hard to be, make very clear-cut comments on some of these organisations because they blend into one and the other and they have overlapping membership and people influencing them um, from within. It's certainly true to say the Irish Volunteers were certainly seen as a, an organisation the IRB could direct from within and use for sort of things like that. Oh, and here we have the house gun running where... Guns were smuggled in from Germany. And before someone gets grumpy about that and says, how dare they do that, the Ulster volunteers had already successfully imported 24,000 rifles in the long gunning running event. And blind eyes had been turned to that. 24,000 rifles is enough to equip a, f a, a, a moderate sized army. Meanwhile, the Irish volunteers uh, with Erskine Childers, who's a figure you might find interesting if you look him up as he intersects with British and Irish history. And uh, and his book, The Riddle of the Sands, is a very interesting book, which had a big impact on what, on issues around World War One. Bought nearly 1,000 rifles purchased from Germany. The Howth gun running ended with a sort of clash with the Dublin Metropolitan Police, as it notes here and the King's Own Scottish Borders at Bachelors Walk. That ended up with the killing of civilians and the wounding of numerous civilians. And it did it, it did wonders for the volunteers' recruitment because basically, although it was a horrible event with the death of those people, it from the point of view of the more militant end of the volunteers, it confirmed their point of view that the British were never going to let them go and that they'd have to fight for freedom. If you want to know more about the Irish Volunteers, your best bet is from that point forward 
to go and look at the article where it transitions to the Easter Rising and after that where they transition into reorganisation under people like Lynch and Collins and other figures and get an idea of how they evolve from there. It's too big a topic to do short presentations about as... I would be here for several hours and also I'd have to really sit here and make notes and do really seriously well-prepared topics. I'm speaking off the cuff to do this. I certainly couldn't do that if I was going to do such a long-winded topic. 